Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's web, uh, webinar titled Construction Specifications, Best Practices and Responsible Specification. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association. I want to welcome you and thank you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend today's webinar sponsored by Dell Tile. It is a AIA and IDCEC accredited program and I will put some instructions in the uh, chat screen, the uh, questions area, and um, we'll make sure you all get your uh, CEUs. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions and we'll answer those at the end of this presentation. If the audio on your computer is poor, Either turn up the volume or call the number on the invite to the webinar and listen on your phone. All NTCA webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented. This will give you easy access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. All right, I'm very excited to introduce today's two speakers. Our first speaker, Whitney Welsh, has been with Daltile for 12 years and is based in Dallas, Texas at the Daltile headquarters. She is a flooring expert in the industry with a background in design and specification sales. She received a Bachelor of Interior Design with a minor in architecture from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. Prior to finding her home at Daltile, she worked as an interior designer at Reese Associates during, oh, excuse me, doing senior living in healthcare. She has held several positions at Delta prior to being the VP of commercial sales, including an architectural rep and commercial sales manager for the Southwest region. She takes pride in connecting with customers from developers to the a and community and contractors. She is passionate about design trends and the future of the flooring industry. She spends her time outside of work with her husband, Clayton, and her two crazy kiddos, Gunnar and Reed. <laughs> our second speaker today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves also, but our second speaker today is Elizabeth Malonso, and I blew her name because I cannot say it correctly. It's French, and uh, it's a beautiful name, but I'm not doing well, so Elizabeth will uh, introduce herself in a minute. But she's a senior architectural representative for Delta. She's responsible for all commercial specifications in Alabama, Mississippi, and the Florida Panhandle. After studying interior design at the University of Alabama, Elizabeth worked at several architectural firms before landing at Davis Architects in Birmingham, Alabama. There she worked on high profile projects at Auburn, Alabama and Sanford University. Then she decided to shift her enthusiasm from selling design ideas to selling tile and natural stone from, um, at Dell Tile. Dell has, has been her home for 12 years and she has led internal committees for employee training, product development, and sales team collaboration. Elizabeth has served in many positions on the IIDA Alabama board, including VP membership and chapter president. She is also a sustaining member of the Junior League of Birmingham. When she is not selling towel, she loves to spend time with her husband, Trey, and their three children, Maggie, Bennett, and Camille. I want to welcome both Elizabeth and Whitney, and uh, I know you're going to enjoy this presentation. So ladies, it's all yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jen. So hi there, I'm I'm Whitney. Again, I'm our VP of Commercial Sales for Dell Tile. I've been in this role for about three years, but I've been with the company for 12, as Jim said. Um, and before I kick it over to Elizabeth, she's going to be the one presenting the, the content today. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a condensed version because we want to leave a few minutes for questions at the end and get you guys out of here within the hour. But I wanted to tee up the why. Why do we have the CEU? Why do we think it's important? Because I need uh, you all to understand the importance of it. A lot has changed in the industry and, and is continuing to rapidly evolve. And it's important for us as Dow Tile to really lead the industry when it comes to technical and product knowledge and a think lab actually put out a survey if you don't know who think lab is i encourage you to to google it and look them up they're a research arm of the sandow brands 
And they put out a survey to everybody that said, what do you value from your local rep? And the number one answer was product and technical knowledge. That's what our reps out there still bring value to their customers and bring it to the field. And so continuing to invest in CEUs and building content is important. For the contractors that are on this call, you think, well, that's towards the A&D community. How is this important for us? And what you'll see throughout this CEU is that we are trying to coach and train new designers that are coming out of school and architects on how to responsibly specify. And so that will positively impact the contractors as you all go to purchase. And it's going to increase that productivity, maybe like a little less value of engineering at the end of the day. Um, so yes, this is geared towards the A&D audience, but it very much benefits contractors. And so we're excited to, to share all this with you today. As you're also going through this with Elizabeth, um, feel free to enter questions into the chat and we'll collect them and try to answer as many as we can at the end. But some other things that have changed in the industry are the number of decision makers per project, which has been hard to keep up with as a manufacturer. The out of market specification percentage, you're seeing specifications across the country, out of market, out of region. Uh, sustainability questions daily hitting us, challenging us to really grow in our sustainability platform at Dell Tile. The work remote versus hybrid versus in office and what does that look like and how are we calling on our customers still successfully? And then last but not least, the increase of digital presence. The majority of specifiers are going to a website 95% of the time, they're starting their journey there to select materials. And so that's why you've seen this influx of multiple tile manufacturers on a finished schedule, which is a contractor's worst nightmare. So that's the why, I hope um, that all makes sense. And so as you go to listen to the CEU, I, I want you to really think through some of the things I'm saying, and, and you're out there living it every day and seeing these industry changes, and we're trying to pivot and stay relevant and keep up. So with that, Elizabeth, I'm gonna turn my camera off. You introduce yourself and then take it away. Awesome, thank you, Whitney, and thank you, Jim. Um, like they both said, I'm Elizabeth Melanson. It's a hard last name. Uh, my maiden name is Smith, so you can get a little bit of a giggle out of that. I really had to learn my new last name when I got married 15 years ago. But to piggyback off what Whitney said, we are seeing such an influx in the number of tile manufacturers and distributors that have come in the market and so that was another why behind this specification or the specification ceu because we were seeing a lot of specifiers specify product incorrectly because all they were doing was clicking a pretty picture online and so we really wanted at dell tile to try to bring that knowledge back to the specifier and make sure that they are specifying products correctly and specifying products that are applicable for the application that they intend it to be and that they are it's meeting the design intent so please keep that in mind as we go through this and without further ado we're going to get started um, i'm also going to turn my camera off so um, it's not a distraction so y'all please um, enter any questions into the chat that you may have send Let's see. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the AIA best practice statement. Y'all know this CEU is supported by the AIA, so we will uh, capture, I'll chat with Jim and we'll figure out how we're going to capture um, if you need credit for this. I know that he mentioned there may be some architects on this call, so we can definitely capture your AIA number and get this reported, as well as IDCEC. So, we like to talk about the four learning objectives when we're taught when we are um, introducing a CEU. Um, we're going to start off by showing you what type of questions to ask um, to narrow down the selection process when you're selecting tile. Then we're going to get into the different types of tile types and standards. And next are the different specification types that we typically see in the architectural world. And then lastly, we'll end with what a good or strong or bad or weak specification looks like and some best practices associated with that. So first, we always tell our designers 
that we want them to ask us questions. And I love this quote, and I hope that y'all can all kind of take this to heart. A good rep is an extension of our design team. Lean on us, your reps, whether that be on the contractor side or on the architectural side, to be the expert in their product category. It can save you time during the design process as well as costly mistakes during the construction process. So, but we want, um, before you to talk to your rep, make sure you understand your client's needs and certain product considerations. So with that being said, let's look at the questions that you should be asking your client to understand their scope and their expectations. What is your client's budget per square foot? What type of visual are they looking for? Where is this tile going? What is it a high traffic area? Is care and maintenance a consideration? And a lot, something really important that we sometimes forget about is what is the product project timeline? Is it six months? Is it, is it three years? Where do we need to be as far as having product available to you? And I know that's especially important for you, the contractor. So first, when determining the budget, we want to know, like, are you looking for the wow factor or do you need something basic to go in your project? Discussing budget up front helps eliminate the pain point of having to value engineer down the road. And we want to make sure that you're also asking about installation costs. Freight is always um, included in some with some manufacturers, but it's not included with others. So we want to make sure that when we're determining our budget, that we include those types of things such as budget and uh, such as installation as well as freight costs. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry, guys. Y'all, please excuse me. This is not the right. This is not the right. Um, CEO, excuse me. I don't know what was happening with this. Okay, here we go. Oh, hold on. I'm so sorry, y'all. I don't know what is going on with this specification situation. Elizabeth, do you need me to pull up? Yes, the do you mind? I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Ladies, would you? Okay, here we go. No, we're ready. Here we go. Sorry, guys. That was my fault. Okay. Not really sure what happened. Okay. So, next. Okay, we're good news. Sorry, guys. I don't know how that popped up, how that got. I had my computer worked on at corporate and something might have gotten shifted, shifted around. So, here we go. Back to um, the visual. So, as we begin the design process, we want to talk about the type of visual you want, such as stone or wood. And these visuals are also going to um, affect your price point. So, right back to that budget thing. And the more that you can communicate to the design intent to your rep, the better they can help you with your design solution. For commercial applications, it's so important to understand where your tile is going. You can put any tile on the wall, but you cannot put any tile on the floor. Make sure you tell your rep where the product project is located because it's an exterior project. Any type of freeze thaw conditions need to be noted. So please ask about tile installation because it's not just carpet. We like to say this. I tell this to my clients sometimes. It's not just carpet where it's fuzzy side up. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes when we're talking about tile. Next is traffic. Commercial applications can obviously have low or high traffic. There can also be standing water or grease accumulation for the back of house areas. And make sure you tell your rep the intended use for the tile so they can make recommendations for the right application. You may need to consider a slip resistant finish for any floor tile that is going to be exposed or any type of standing water. Make sure you find out what type of budget is allowed for maintenance. This is where you may want to involve the owner or the facilities management team. A solid color, color whether it is light or dark, will show any type of dirt. Floor tiles with patterns or high movement in the visual will help disguise that dirt. And we all know that tile is the most durable type 
um, of any flooring product, but you want to make sure that the visual reflects the amount of foot traffic and maintenance schedule. So I really love to give real life examples when I'm giving CEUs, and this one really struck home for me, especially when we're talking about care and maintenance. So when I first started as an architectural rep with Dow Tile, I was sent to a large um, corporate bank facility that we were working on to one of the resale locations, and they had white tile in the teller line. Well, they weren't really keeping up with the maintenance properly, and they weren't mopping the floors properly, and they could not keep the tile clean. So just know that if you're specifying tile that is either solid, light, or dark, that you're going to have to have a good maintenance schedule and a good maintenance budget to include that in um, when you're determining what to specify. Because we want to disguise the dirt <laughs> rather than show it off. So also when selecting finishes, you need to consider the project timeline. This could impact the lead time of your project, of the products you're specifying. And you know, if there's a long lead time, particularly for special order or custom products, make sure you note that in the specifications and finish schedule. I used to have a firm in Jackson, funnily enough, Jim, that would, um, if they had put a, if they specified a tile that had a long lead time, they would put it in the specifications and they would put a disclaimer saying that if, the tile contractor did not provide proof of order with the appropriate amount of lead time that the contractor was responsible for the reselection of tile products or any products that it would affect. So that we know that that is something really important that we want designers to include in their specifications and to take into consideration when specifying a um, new um, when um, making a specifications, making specifications, excuse me. So there are three, basically three types of, uh, three buckets of questions. What are the tile types? This is about understanding the different types of tile. A rectified porcelain is going to be more expensive than glazed ceramic. For aesthetics, do you want large format or do you want a mosaic? For exteriors, there are several options when it comes to pavers and to cladding. What are the test results? Again, this is key for a commercial project. Every manufacturer should publish the test results for each series. And this includes water absorption, DCOF, abrasion resistance, and breaking strength. When considering which manufacturer to go with, how long have they been in business and where are their product, products manufactured? If you are new to the design process, we always ask, uh, suggest that you ask a more tenured designer if they're available to you who, what manufacturers they trust based on past experience. Look at the manufacturer's website to see if they have any case studies available. Water absorption is important to consider because of stain resistance and freeze thaw conditions. An example of an impervious tile is porcelain, vitreous is a pressed floor tile, semi-vitreous is quarry, and non-vitreous is a glazed wall tile with a tout body. DCOF numbers are broken out by interior floors, exterior floors, and ramps and stairs. The abrasion resistance test is when the tile starts to show wear, but it so it definitely needs to be a four or higher for commercial use. And the most hardness test is for glazed tile, and it should be a seven out of 10. For breaking strength, you need to know basically that a wall tile pretty much cannot be used on the floor because of its low breaking strength and all other tiles listed are intended for commercial floor use. What is the difference between a manufacturer and a distributor? A manufacturer is typically has more control over lead time with their products. Again, what we talked about earlier, it's important to ask if freight is included in the price or if it's an add-on and a reputable company will have all pertinent testing information to easily locate, uh, easily locate on their website or sample boards. Sustainable products are a necessity in today's world, and the products that you specify have, not, have to not only look good, but you also need to know what they're made of and their environmental impact. Does the product you are specifying have an EPD, an HPD, or a declare label? That is something important that your clients 
and specifiers definitely want to know. So in this next section, we're going to learn about the different tile types and ANSI standards associated with tile products and installation methods. And guys, full disclosure, this can get a little um, meaty. So y'all just bear with me and type in any questions that you have. But we know that this is important um, when we're trying to educate our interior designers and architects about the different tile types and where they're applicable and how it can be used um, and where different types of tile can be used. So, like we uh, touched on earlier a little bit, there are basically three different types of categories when it comes to tile types. The size of the tile, which determines which type it is. A mosaic is something that is smaller than nine square inches. A paver tile is greater than nine square inches and is typically pressed. And the thin profile porcelain panels that are newer to the market are typically around three meters by one meter. So think of small, medium, and extra large. Ceramic is the general, a generic term for any type of fired clay product. The term porcelain is associated with the absorption of tile, of the tile, and a porcelain tile is very dense with an absorption of less than 0.5%. You should also verify with the manufacturer if it is a certified porcelain tile because not all porcelain is created equal. We want you to verify where the porcelain is manufactured and again that it is a certified porcelain tile. To put it very simply there's a few there's two different categories of tile glazed and color body. So glaze is the typically the most cost effective type of tile. It has an impervious facial finish used to an impervious porcelain body. It has a high range of flexibility with products from design pricing and technical standpoint. And then we typically um, use inkjet technology is one of the newer technologies as opposed to roller printing is what we were using in the past. Color body is the most common type of uh, body, a common type of porcelain tile because you get the most consistent coloring with the body and the glaze. The surface design does not continue through the body of the tile. However, typically the main color in the glaze is the color of the body. So under the umbrella of color body tile, we have through body and double loaded porcelain. So in regards to the term through body, you may hear it referenced as unglazed or a technical porcelain in the industry. And then a double loaded porcelain, as you can see here in the picture, has a color body or through body about a quarter to a third through uh, the top of the tile that's fused to a typical gray porcelain body. Um, and that allows for, um, it's very cost effective and while still having some of the properties of a through body tile. So again, here's another silly analogy. I like to think of this as a carrot and a radish. So your carrot is gonna be your through body porcelain tile. So it's orange on the outside and the color goes all the way through. Whereas a glazed porcelain is similar to a radish where you have the color or pattern on the outside while it's white on the inside. So when you cut it, the color does not go all the way through. So that's a silly little um, reference that you can take with you, but you probably won't forget. So in addition to those types of tile, there's also quarry tile and glazed wall tile, and they use two different types of clay. So quarry tile uses a natural clay or shale, and they are extruded through um, a process, well, extruded instead of pressed. And they're great for back of house areas, since it, since it does not have, uh, it does have absorption compared to an epoxy floor, floor that has no absorption. A glazed wall tile is typically a talc body, so the absorption is much higher than that of a quarry or a porcelain. And because of their higher absorption, they are not recommended for exterior applications. So again, we I had a client specify some uh, red, glazed wall tile and they put it on the exterior of a building and it cracked and we did not warranty that material because we do not warranty products that are used improperly so that's something we definitely always want to bring to their attention because uh, client or architect's attention because 
we don't want them to be responsible and we want everybody to look good. So we want everybody to use the right product where it is appropriate. So um, it ended up the architect had to pay for the tile to be replaced and it had to be a through body porcelain tile, which as we all know in red is a lot more expensive than a typical glazed wall tile. So don't, the moral of the story, just use products where it says that it is appropriate to be used. So I know that we all know that the TCNA is a leader um, in the development of the tile industry criteria for health safe, safety, uh, sustainability, material and environmental transparency, internal certification, and dozens of quality standards that protect consumers. They find solutions through consensus building, research and testing, advocacy and outreach, and they represent over 95% of the tile industry manufacturing in North America. The TCNA members manufacture ceramic tile, tile installation materials, tile equipment, raw materials, and other tile related products along with the importers and distributors that support it. So the TCNA was established in 1945 and it became the, well, the, I'm sorry, the TCA was, excuse me, established in 1945 and it became the, NAT, the NTC, the TCNA, excuse me, in 2005, and the name change reflects its membership to all of North America. So we really like to promote that the TCN, uh, TCNA handbook is a consensus of tile industry representatives, and it assists in clarifying and standardizing installation specifications for tile. What I like to tell my clients a lot of the times is this is just a really big book of details that is so great to reference but it does not preclude local building codes, ordinance, or trade practices. When I started at Dell Tile in 2011, I believe it was the next year in 2012 that the TCNA grew by, you know, 200 pages. It went from just tile to include natural stone and glass. So now I like to joke that it's really lovely um, bedtime reading material. <laughs> so since we talked about uh, the different types of tile, uh, but we're going to talk about installation now. So ANSI, um, these ANSI standards are associated with the installation of ceramic tile. So ANSI 108 defines that installation and A118 and A136 define the test methods and physical properties for ceramic tile installation materials. So these are standards that are intended, uh, intended to be referenced or included in the, sec uh, the ceramic tile uh, section of the project specifications. ANSI 137.1 is, uh, it presents voluntary standard specifications for the ceramic tile itself. It lists and defines various types, sizes, properties, grading procedures for ceramic tile, including mosaic tile, Cory tile, press tile, glaze wall tile, porcelain tile, trim units, and specialty tile. That is a lot. And this standard um, also provides quality criteria for buyers, specifiers, installers, manufacturers, and the public in general. I really always like to point out the master grade certificate part of ANSI 137.1 and encourage where applicable that the um, uh, that you as an architect include a master grade certificate in your specification to make sure that the tile that arrives to your job site meets this ANSI A137-1 standard. So moving on from wall tile or tile in general to glass tile. So this standard lists and defines various types, sizes, and physical properties for glass tile. And some of the key issues that we address here are strength criteria, definitions and test procedures for measuring translucence, levels of recycled content. Typically, we see a good bit of recycled content in glass tile. We know that's important for sustainability uh, concerns that any clients may, may have. And this also, includes categorization by size and methods of manufacture. The large format, for this is one of the newer 
um, ANSI standards. So this is the ANSI standard for large gauge porcelain uh, tiles or porcelain tiles or slab panels or slabs, what we, um, like we talked about earlier, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. They, this describes the minimum physical properties and grading procedures for gauge porcelain tiles and gauge porcelain tiles and slabs. And so gauge meaning that is manufactured to a thickness that is specific um, and largely associated with installation and use. So in, also included in this, we have provisions for um, back layer reinforcing for these large panels, floor and wall installation procedures, strength criteria for gauge products, as well as provisions for sampling and visual inspection, um, considering that the tiles and panels can be really, really large. So it's really important to us that we sample uh, these products appropriately and everybody has the same expectation. Again, uh, included in this is gonna also be substrate requirements, lippage criteria, and kind of all the things you need to know to install and specify these large format porcelain panels. So this is the, so in addition to the last one we just talked about, this is also the new handbook devoted. So that was the ANSI standard, just to clarify, because this can kind of get a little confusing. That was the ANSI standard we just talked about, whereas now the porcelain panels, this is installation methods for gauge porcelain tiles. And so this is gonna be similar to the ANSI, I mean, I'm sorry, the TCNA handbook, right? So it will just, um, you will have details with lippage require, uh, criteria and substrate requirements. If you wanna learn how TAL can contribute to LEED credits, this is a really great resource. TAL is one of the most sustainable flooring materials due to its long lifespan and low maintenance costs. And yes, funnily enough, we have another CEU called the TAL Industry and Green Building that goes into detail about the benefits of using ceramic tile in a project. All right, so now we are finished with the codes part, but we feel like that's, like I said earlier, super important to include to make sure that everyone is very aware of how tile should be used and why you can't use certain tile in certain applications. So now we're going to talk about the different types of specifications that are common in today's market. A construction specification or architectural specification is a document that states how a building is to be constructed, demolished, altered, or removed. If it's concise, it should articulate design decisions and apply them to construction the construction sequence. The specification defines the products used and quality standards of a project's design. Typically, specifications are written by architects, interior designers, or engineers. And large architectural firms typically employ architects that specialize in writing these specifications. So some of the qualifications needed to write specifications are familiarity with the project, including the design philosophy or the design intent, expert um, expertise in editorial, technical, and contractual matters, and familiarity with national and local building codes and standards. When we are referencing tile specifications, we are referring to the 9300 section of the document. Here you will find all the information needed to complete the project the way the specifier intended. Some information that you can find in this section includes the, necessi the necessary materials to complete the work, the overall scope of the work, how the material installation fits into the overall construction timeline, the specified material, and how the material is intended to be installed. Other requirements that are listed in specifications are the quality of workmanship desired, testing requirements for materials and installation, and any necessary safety standards. So now let's talk about the four main types of specifications, descriptive, performance, reference, and proprietary. Often more than one specifying method, sometimes all of them, so it can get a little confusing, uh, are used in the same specification spe section. First, the first one we're gonna talk about is what you see here, the descriptive specification. This provides a written detail of all product properties without the use of trade or brand names. 
It is a non-restrictive specification, commonly referred to as open, meaning that there can be many products that fit this description. Typically, the tile contractor will submit options through the general contractor for the architect to review and approve. The second type is the performance specification. These set an expectation of a desired result, but it does not describe the means on how to achieve it. One thing to note about a performance spec, the designer should call out the means of validation to demonstrate that the performance requirements have been met. So the timing in which the validation should be performed is also an important detail to put in the specification section. And it is also considered an open specification as well. Next is the reference specification. Reference specifications specify individual standards developed by standards setting organizations such as the ASTM, ANSI, and various states and the federal government um, that the submitted manufacturers must meet. Reference specifications are typically open by using nationally recognized standards developed by independent and third party standard setting organizations. And I have a great example about, of that that we're gonna talk about in a, little, in a little bit. Proprietary specifications are the most common type of specification. They identify the desired product by brand or trade name, model or style designation and important characteristics. They may also include the name of the manufacturer and or city um, and state where, so it's necessary to identify the source of the specified product. And within proprietary specifications, we'd see two types of specific kind of subtypes, open and closed. The specifier should always request their client direction on whether open, closed, or sole sourced specifications are allowable and the ground rules for each. And for public work, some jurisdictions um, discourage or prohibit proprietary specifying of any sort for public work. We've talked about open on specifications on those previous slides, and now we're going to talk about the closed ones. So, closed proprietary specifications are a very common type of specification. They do not allow for equivalent products. However, multiple products can be named under this section. They do not allow for substitutions, and the bidders must price the exact product. There are no equals allowed in the closed proprietary specification. A more stringent type of closed proprietary specification is referred to as a single source. In this instance, only one manufacturer is listed and there are no equals exception accepted. So closed proprietary specifications and sole sourcing, as you can tell, they greatly limit competition. So where we want competition among suppliers, any type of proprietary specification reduces that competition, but it also helps ensure the desired quality and product features. So we always wanna stress that if you are going with a closed proprietary specification that you consult your owner to make sure that it, it is acceptable to them because it greatly limits the competition, whether it be pricing or any other type of concerns that uh, they're worried about. Open proprietary specifications are often referred to as basis of design specifications. So I don't know about y'all, but this is definitely the most common type of specification that we see in today's market. In this type of spec, one product is named and the designer provides other equal products or manufacturers for the bidders. The equals allow for the contractors to bid on equivalent products, but not that are not necessarily um, named in the specification. In the case of open or closed proprietary specifying, the minimum number of manufacturers or products indicated is often unclear. Private owners may direct the number to be named while public owners should typically confer with their procurement leaders and legal counsel. Um, typically what we see here is about three, between three and four um, equals that are listed, uh, manufacturers that are listed. So that's kind of what we commonplace, see most commonplace, but I mean, I've seen specifications that have, you know, up to 10 and 11 uh, equals listed. So we know that specifications um, can vary from market to market, but some are inherently stronger than others. And so 
With imports being more commonplace in the market, strong specifications are imperative to ensure that the design and performance intent is achieved. Some specification types that we talked about earlier allow for a broader range of products that are allowed, so they may not achieve the desired result. As always, it is important to discuss with the client the different specification options. And again, it's another quote that I love. Because tile is a permanent finish, the lowest bid should not be the driving factor, but rather who is the most qualified to perform the work of the uh, perform the scope of the work specified. And I know all the tile contractors on the call, I know that y'all feel that. So now we're going to talk a little bit about qualified labor, which we feel is important to include in this spec and we want designers to include them in their specifications but so we're going to talk about um how you can include that in your specifications so first we know that the difference between trained and experienced installers from inexperienced installers is noticeably present in work and the difference between a quality contractor and a deficient one is an apparent in their service and business operations. And together, we all can transform um, the designer's concept into reality. So whether you're a design build professional, selecting tile contractors regularly, or a homeowner with a single tile project, it's impossible to overestimate the importance of finding qualified contractors and installers. So the first program we're going to talk about is CTEF, and they launched their Certified Tile Installer Program through the Ceramic Tile Education Foundation. It launched in 2008 to provide for means for good, knowledgeable tile installers to verify their skills and promote themselves to clients and employers. Any installer can uh, apply to become a certified installer, and they must have two years of hands-on experience as the lead installer in ceramic setting tile on a full-time basis. Experience is defined as having full responsibility for substrate prep, layout, coordinating with other trades, along with properly installing underlayment, tile, grouting, and sealant materials. And there's also a professional uh, proficiency exam that is 155 questions, open book, multiple choice test. Next, there's a hands-on portion of the test that allows for the evaluators to verify that the applicant has the skills to deliver an installation that meets industry performance and workmanship standards. They must demonstrate their ability to execute a complex layout and proper installation of all of these things, a vapor retardant membrane, backer board, tiles, grout, and flexible caulk or flexible seal on our caulk. For each installation material, the applicant is scored on various aspects of worsmanship relevant to producing installation that will endure use and satisfy even the discriminating client. And I will say when we present the, when I presented the CEU, a lot of um, interior designers and architects are surprised to know that they can specify their, uh, what type of tile installer that they, um, put in their, well, what type of installer, the qualifications of their installer to put in their specifications, because a lot of them have been burned in the past with not receiving good tile work, whether it be through a bid process or similar. So the NTCA, in addition to the, um, to the installers, the NTCA developed the five-star accreditation program to establish high standards for business entities who focus on tile and stone into installation. So the NTCA five-star contractors are going to be the ones that employ the um, CTEF certified installers. So by achieving this accreditation, companies or business ent entities demonstrate their commitment to advancing the professionalism of the tile and stone industry. And a key component of the accreditation program is an independent third-party review. So similar to ANSI standards, things like that is a third party review of um, the business entity itself. So some of the standards that they use to apply for accreditation, they must adhere to, they must focus on tile installation that aligns with industry standards and best practices. They must have the financial capability to conduct stated business and shall have adequate resources to cover associated liabilities. Um, I've actually been 
burn that by this lately. I had a tile contractor that had to leave a job because they did not bid the job properly and it made them go bankrupt, which is unfortunate. So, but by specifying an NTCA five-star contractor, you can uh, maybe avoid some of that. They, um, they honor warranties and comply with guarantees made to clients and they comply with all applicable, uh, applicable laws and reg regulations. And again, they, in addition to all those things, they operate ethically and hold by upholding and abiding the five-star contractor accreditation code of ethics. So you know, that's pretty important. On the screen is a copy of master spec language when it comes to qualified labor. As you will see, it gives your, you, the client or customer and architect, many options of qualified labor resources that you can find one, so you can find one that best fits your project. And here is a list of resources that you can reach out for more information on qualified labor language. So, I'm sure we all want to have strong specifications, right? This is kind of where the rubber hits the road for me. Well, let's talk about how we can make that happen. Here are a few examples of complications with some specifications that can lead to the design intent not being met. For this spec that you see on your screen, there are way too many manufacturers listed. While there's no minimum or maximum number of equals listed or required, too many can lead to challenges. We all know that if we're given too many choices, it never works out in our favor. We all know the dreaded, we've all worked with the dreaded church committee where everybody has an opinion. So we don't want that to happen here. Some of these tile manufacturers aren't even in business anymore. And it is best to narrow down to the manufacturers that you have a relationship with so that if an issue arises, you will have a solid point of contact to lean on. The same thing goes, oh, I'm sorry, the same thing goes for mortar. It's always best to have a personal connection with your rep so you can address any questions with them. Issues are more common with the adhesion of the tile rather than the tile itself, so this is really important. Your tile rep can often connect you with setting material manufacturers if you're not familiar with your local rep. Another common concern is that specifications are too broad. While this is considered a descriptive specification, there isn't much detail provided at all. The range of tile that meets these specifications are broad, so the designer may not, might not get what they intended. This reference and descriptive specification is too broad in regard, regards to mortar. More detail is needed, and here is the real life example that I was telling you all about earlier. So when I first started as an ARC rep, I was called to a project um, out of town where a lot of tile was specified in the cafeteria project. It was one of our resinous-based tiles or a tile that was resinous-based and it really required a really robust mortar and the tile or the architect only specified that the mortar had to meet the ANSI standard and then listed about 10 to 15 you know mortar manufacturers that were acceptable. And of course, we all know that, I mean, just like me or anyone else, when you're presented with, op with options, you're gonna choose the least expensive option. Well, in this case, the least expensive option did not allow for the tile to properly adhere to the wall. And so the tile in turn was falling off about two years later. So I had the architect come ask me, hey, are my specifications wrong? And it's not that their specifications were wrong, it's that they just weren't robust enough to meet the needs for the tile that they were adhering to the wall. So similar to this, the specification was too broad. So really asking your reps and being in touch with them, using them as an extension of your design team is really beneficial because that could have prevented some of that later headache that we achieved when we are that we felt when we were trying um, to figure out why this tile was falling off the wall. Another common concern is that um, oh I'm sorry wrong <laughs> um, 
I just talked about that with the influx of international vendors on the market. And this is something that we are really seeing a good bit of. It is important to know the manufacturer that's making the material. Here in this specific specification, there are four different manufacturers listed and it makes for very difficult contractors. I know you feel this for the contractor to procure material from all these different manufacturers and fewer numbers of vendors really allow for a better chance uh, to secure materials in a timely manner. Okay, enough with the weak stuff. And now let's talk about some strong specifications. So this is an example of an open proprietary specification with a basis of design listed in the finished schedule along with equal manufacturers listed. Here, the designer has chosen what they wanted and the equal manufacturers have to provide a similar tile to the one listed in the basis of design. There is plenty of competition, yet there is something to reference. Here is another example where a tile is listed on the finished schedule, yet there are other manufacturers listed. There is also descriptive language listed in the specification so the bidders know what to submit. So this is a great way to ensure that you achieve the design intent. Lastly, here are some similar examples with mortar. We surely don't need, like we talked about earlier, the tile falling off the walls. So let's not um, forget the tile, uh, the product behind the tile as well. And that is it. And we can open that up for questions. Jim, Whitney. Wow, that was great. That was fantastic. A lot of information. I do want to thank all of our attendees. This is the very first webinar in 10 years where not one person left during the whole program. I uh, was watching the same thing. I said, good job, Elizabeth. She's maintaining her audience. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of really technical content. So um, that's hard to do with this one. So appreciate everybody staying on and staying engaged. A lot of information. Um, I don't know if people don't have questions or if they are just thinking everything through and trying to figure it out. But if you do have questions, if our audience does have questions, tomorrow you'll get an email from me um, that will thank you for attending with my email address. You can definitely send me a message. I'll connect you with Elizabeth and Whitney and we can uh, answer questions for you. Look, we got one just came in. Here we go. Oh, they're coming in right and left now. Oh, here's, um, here's the question. Is ASTM C1028 still accurate for coefficient of friction? Elizabeth, do you know the answer to that? I'm sorry, I, you cut out, Jim. I didn't hear you. Did you say 1028? C1028. Is that still yeah. accurate for coefficient of friction? Hmm. I think, and I'll have to go back and double check, but I'm almost positive that C1028 was the old standard, which was the static coefficient of friction, and that the new standard is an ANSI standard, and I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I know we have so it I, I think it's, in our I think other. It's, I, think it's, I think it's uh, ANSI 137. And it's now it's now the DCOF, DCOF. Instead yeah, of so yes. And, yeah, and, the, the static static coefficient of friction is no more. It's now just dynamic coefficient of friction, DCOF. Yep. So right. please look that up. It's in your ANSI specification. Uh, um, which one was it in, Whitney? The uh, A It looks like it's 137, ANSI 137. 137 and um, we'll be able to answer that. All right. Um, someone's asking me how many people attended the webinar. So. <laughs> We had about 50 attendees today. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, can we get a copy of the presentation file? So this will be, as I mentioned at the beginning, starting tomorrow afternoon, it will be on the NTCA YouTube page. And you can go in there and watch it at any time and share it with anyone that you'd like. You can actually go to NTCA uh, website, which is tile-assn.com. And right at the top, just click on that little YouTube button. It'll take you right to the, the page and it will be there listed for you. All right, let's see what else we have. How can we get a copy of the presentation? I just answered that one. So um, yep. 
Here's one. With so much competition out there, is the best way for a newer motor manufacturer to help specifier and get specified? Is the best way for a I think what is the best way for a new newer mortar manufacturer to have specifiers and get specified? So a mortar manufacturer is trying to get specifications? That's what the question's asking? Don't you believe they should start making uh, architectural calls and showing their products to, to those architects? And, and yeah, those my suggestion uh, for specifically a mortar manufacturer would be to take an approach with the A and D community of killing multiple birds with one stone. So you have to hit your wagon to other um, non-competing or supportive vendors in the industry where you can go in together. Uh, an architect or designer is much more likely to give you an audience if there's a tile person and a vinyl person and a carpet person, like all the flooring, non-competing, and then you come in as the, the mortar or the the supportive piece, the installation piece to the product. So I, I would encourage you to do that. It's my recommendation. Elizabeth, would you agree? Yeah, I was going to say designers always want to see the pretty stuff. So if you can tack on to some of the pretty stuff, then mm -hmm. that's a good way to get your foot in the door. That's a real good point. Real good point. Yeah. All right. So the next one, this one is, is dear to my heart. How Many architects, designers are using old master specs. What are manufacturers, reps doing to educate the A and D community to educate them? I can definitely. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I'll start, and Elizabeth can chime in. So, what we find ourselves doing for the A and D community that is behind the times, or they're not using accurate uh, master specs, or they don't have that in-house spec person. That's pretty rare these days to see in-house. They're like outsourcing all of their, their specs. So what we try to do is offer to help. We partner with a mortar manufacturer who's really strong in that space, or we'll take a look at their spec and offer to help them update it to some of the things where you saw Elizabeth presenting what good looks like. We'll offer to help them a, a massage and adjust it so it, it almost is to our benefit. Um, so yeah, I, I would suggest that we re, we relook at it. There's a lot that's out of date out there that is a very accurate and a very um relevant question so elizabeth do you have anything to add i was going to say we see a lot of it especially when we're getting certain types of open specifications that we're asked to provide products for that a lot of some of the descriptive specifications like the descriptions aren't correct and they don't even exist anymore so we are seeing a lot of that and how we're trying, this program is kind of how we're gonna trying to start combating that. You know, I'll always tell my clients, it is always better to ask the questions than not because you don't know, you know, what you don't know. I had a client the other day be like, well, how was I supposed to know that? And I was like, well, you, you did ask. So it's always better to ask the questions whether you feel silly asking the questions or not. We would ask, I think Whitney would agree, Jim, you would agree, we want the tile industry to look great as a whole. So we wanna help you however we can, whether your question to you might seem silly, but maybe it's not silly. And maybe it's something really relevant and we want us all to look good. So. Mm -hmm. Right. There are no bad questions, no matter right. what. I will tell every single one, whether you're an architect, designer, contractor, no bad questions just ask please exactly that's yeah. what i tell them just ask don't be embarrassed just ask that's right all right let's see here what we got here all right um so here's a comment a good companion document to this presentation for the a and d community may be the tile initiative and the tile the natural choice found in the tile council of north america handbook and they can definitely help with similar, the same things we're talking about today. They're very, very helpful, so yeah. Yeah, so we have our like almost OG CEU is still around, Advanced Ceramic Tile. Um, it's really, yes. to us, it's like Tile 101. It's it's uh, what we start with when we first get our foot in the door at an architect or designer. It's the first presentation we lead with, and it has all of that in there. 
as as well everything that you just listed off and so this this ceu you know we haven't launched a new ceu in quite some time and when we uh, marianne randall if you guys are familiar with her um, and elizabeth and myself sat down and said from a specification and andy perspective what's a big challenge or a problem and it's the finished schedules that are coming out where there's 13 other tile manufacturers in addition to us listed. And that it's a problem. It didn't used to be that way. In the good old days when Elizabeth and I started with Dow Tile 12 years ago, it wasn't like that. And so it's it's made the contractor's world really chaotic and messy. And so we we created this to try to be a solution um, and how to fix that. But everything that you just, whoever asked that question, that's very much prevalent in our original CEU that we still give daily all the time. So. There are some more questions, but I do want to give the compliments and let you know there are many compliments saying excellent presentation. Even some, uh -huh. even one of our long-standing members of the NTCA said it's the best best seminar ever. So uh, Elizabeth, that's all Elizabeth. This is her brain. Just snap them at the beginning. Sorry about that, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, funny, Elizabeth sent no. her laptop back here to corporate to get fixed and it looks like maybe the the, ver the template that we started with, it like went back to the original. I'm so, I had it, I was like ready to open it up and share it for you. But um, no, we oh see that just, all that did was just show, hey, we make mistakes, we're human too. We're, you know, you just gotta pivot in the moment and keep going. So you did great. It off over here. It's fantastic. We do have a, yeah here that I really can't speak to so I'm going to read it and I hope you guys know what it is so what is your opinion on CDT certification through CSI for a manufacturer rep is it necessary hmm so I do know what that is and I think it's more relevant for architects but what I will say is no matter at, when you're on the manufacturer side any type of certification to me is a credibility factor. So whether it's CTE, whether it's registered interior designer, no matter what it is, it's just going to give you that link, that commonality, that language between the customer and yourself and be credible. I'll actually tell you, I think, Elizabeth, do you have your RID still? I can't remember, you do? So Elizabeth still maintains her interior design license, which is not easy to do. You have to give 12 credits, you have to get 12 credits a year. So she's out here giving, 50 CEUs a year, but then she has to also find time herself to go get 12. It's not easy as a rep. I actually just let my uh, RID go last year. It was just too much. At this point, I'm not going back to design. I'm pretty confident in saying that. <laughs> and so I, I did let mine go. And it was like, I cried a little bit. It was hard to, to that NCIDQ almost killed me. So, um, but, I, but anytime you go to invest in yourself, and do anything like that, it's just going to give you a leg up from the competitor and give you a, a credibility factor. All right, everyone, thank you for attending today. If any of you are coming to uh, Total Solutions Plus in New Orleans next weekend, Whitney will be there. You can ask her all, you can track her down and ask all your questions, definitely. Or come and see us, we'd love to see you. Um, just let you know our next webinar is, uh, I believe, November 14th. November 14th. So look for an invite to that. Thank you, ladies. You did a phenomenal job. And I appreciate Thank you, Jim. it. I'll see you this weekend. And Elizabeth, really nice to meet you. Take Hi, care. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.